Hello everyone, welcome back. So last time we talked about the concept of a steady flow engineering design. And I said, there's a lot of them. So since there's a lot of them, let's go through them. Now, the first two I'm gonna talk about are the nozzle and the diffuser. There we go, pin's working, looks good. And they're very, very basic. Simply, the nozzle makes air go faster, the diffuser makes air go slower. And you're used to this already, after all, you did this probably a whole lot when you were a child because everybody, I'm sure everybody at some point has taken a straw, put a little piece of paper in it and shot it at their brother or sister. And so what is that? Well, that's sort of a nozzle. You're taking air, your cheeks are much wider than the straw's diameter and you're blowing air through it which makes it go much, much faster. Interestingly enough, if you're supersonic, this is actually completely reversed. Why? That's for another lesson. Okay, so where are these used? They're used everywhere. Engines, rockets, spacecraft, and even garden hoses because we need that water to go fast. So nozzle makes stuff go faster, and a diffuser makes stuff go slower. Nozzle decreases the pressure, diffuser increases the pressure. So how's our energy balance look? Well, energy in is equal to energy out. We're saying that this is adiabatic, so we don't have any heat transfer. You can, we're just assuming we don't for now. And so with that, I'm gonna have my enthalpy plus the kinetic energy um, being the t energy terms I care about. Because in this case, I have velocity changing quite a bit. And so I actually do have to take into account that kinetic energy term. Now, I'm not gonna leave you right there. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and do an example because I'm talking about these things. It makes more sense just to do an example right along with it. So right here, we see we have a jet engine, and we're looking specifically at the diffuser of a jet engine. Now, remember, what does a diffuser do? Well, I'll draw it for you, and we'll see it really quick before we get into this problem. So what does a diffuser do? Well, a diffuser causes the velocity to go in to slow down. So why do we do that? We do that because the pressure increases. We want the pressure to increase because in this jet engine, it's going to go from the diffuser into the compressor. You can already see the beginnings of the, well, that's not really the compressor there, but that's adding a little bit of compression right there before it gets to the real compressor. We have the compressor before it gets to the combustor. It's all about increasing the pressure before it combusts it. So this is just helping along with that. Okay. So with that in mind, let's look at all this stuff. So we have air, good to know, 10 degrees Celsius, 80 kilopascals. And here's the diffuser of a jet engine with a velocity of 200 meters per second. Cool. It tells me the inlet area of the diffuser is 0.4 meters squared. Then it says that the air leaves the diffuser with a velocity that is very small, so we're gonna say that's pretty much zero compared to the inlet velocity. And then we're gonna determine the mass flow rate of the air and the temperature of the air leaving the diffuser. Okay, that's not too terrible. Mass flow rate we can pretty much get from the beginning because we've got velocities and areas. Um, and we can get density from the temperature and pressure. And the temperature, we're gonna get that by finding the enthalpy at the end and figuring out what that is for air. Not bad. Okay, so let's calculate that mass flow first. Now, I went ahead and wrote this equation now, but just so you know, we're just using the ideal gas equation here. PV equals RC. That's all we're doing. Um, why can we do that? Because we're using it for air. We're not using this for water. We're using it for air, and air can be treated as an ideal gas in most circumstances. So, since it gave me the temperature, and it gave me the pressure, I can just plug those in. If you look here, you notice that I went ahead and converted to absolute units for Kelvin. You always have to do that, otherwise it's gonna be going horribly wrong. And I chose my specific gas constant such that it matched all my units. So you can see it has kilopascals, I've got kilopascals. It's got Kelvin, I've got Kelvin. And so it makes things a lot more simple. From that, I get my density, or sorry, my specific volume of 1.015 meters cubed per kilogram. Okay, that wasn't terrible. Let's go on to the next stop. Now we've had an equation for specific volume for quite a while. Though usually we have it as density times velocity times area. And just remember that density is just the same as one over my specific volume and vice versa. So when I do that, I can get my mass flow rate, which is 78.8 kilograms per second. We're already halfway through this problem. It's going well, I'm excited about it. Let's keep going. So for step two, we need to set up an energy balance. 
Remember, for this, the energy in is equal to the energy out. And see the dots right there? This is over time. That's why we have the m dot in our equations. So I can write that out if I want to. One question you might have is, well, why is this one, that's one, but this one's no one? This is because I don't have multiple outlets or multiple inlets. I only have one inlet, one outlet. So mass flow, or sorry, my conservation mass simply says that all of it has to come out. So my m dot in will be equal to my m dot out. There we go. And now my pencil has to stop working, so I'm gonna have to. Come on, pen. There we are. So they have to be equal to each other. That's what happens when your battery starts dying while you're making a video. Okay. Beyond that, we already know a little bit more about this problem because I wrote out the general form for a diffuser and nozzle. We, it told us that the velocity leaving is pretty much zero which helps me out with this problem. You also see that I've got m dot on both sides, so that can be canceled. And so I have a really simple problem with calculating the enthalpy at the end, and then therefore the temperature. Let's do that. Now, I have an easy equation for the enthalpy at the end, but I don't actually know my initial enthalpy. How am I gonna calculate that? Tables, it's not that hard. So it says to go to table A17. I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm going to show that to you now through the magic of, you know, video magic. Give me one second. Okay, and here we are in McGraw-Hill Connect. Now, if you're not using McGraw-Hill Connect using a physical textbook, this still helps you. Because all I'm doing here is I'm opening up the textbook. And I was apparently looking at chapter 6 last. Cool. So I'm going to go over here to the con table of contents. I want to scroll down until I get to my appendices. Now, remember that we are in metric or sorry, metric SI units um, so I'm gonna go down here to appendix one that already helped you out because I told you it was table a 17 what is that that's simply the ideal gas properties of air and what does that specifically mean well if I click on it you'll see so all it is is that for air it gives you the temperature the enthalpy internal energy and entropy plus this weird thing um, for each temperature. If you get something in between, you have to interpolate, but we can go for there. Now, this temperature is in Kelvin, and if I go back to my problem statement, which I'm going to do to you right now, here it is. Our temperature was 10 degrees Celsius, 283 Kelvin. So I'm pretty much right in between these two. Um, so I would have to interpolate, but I want you to look at something real quick so we can avoid interpolating. 280 Kelvin, 280.13 kilojoules per kilogram. 285 Kelvin, 285.14 kilojoules per kilogram. So if I'm at 283, what do you think the enthalpy is going to be? 283. I don't actually need to interpolate all that much. That's just like a coincidence. Like you know, Don't look at too deeply into that. Um, it works really well for air, not for everything else. As you see, as you get to higher temperatures, it begins to go off. So it only really works for these low temperatures. But it's nice for us for this problem. And so I'm going to use it. Okay. So with that in mind, you've seen the table, you see where we get the information, so I'm going to jump back to the problem now. Okay, so here we are, we see that for 283 Kelvin, my enthalpy is 283.14, I actually did interpolate to get the exact number, but you really could have avoided it and still gotten a very accurate answer. Then I'm going to plug that into my equation to get the final enthalpy. So I know this, I also know that V2 is zero. And so if I plug all that in, I get a value of 303.14 kilojoules per kilogram. And just based on our initial, like, you know, um, view of that table, you probably can guess that the temperature is going to be 303 Kelvin. You could totally interpolate. You get the exact number if you wanted to, but it's so close to these low numbers that it just works out great. Okay, that's it for this one. We'll go into some more steady flow engineering devices next time. Thanks for listening. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.